Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been enduring a lot of windstorms, uh, thunderstorms, uh, hail. We had snow yesterday. So, been going through a lot out here. <laughs> so, God's been watching over us, been protecting us, a lot of trees falling down and whatnot. But, Brothers in Christ, it's going to be a good study, a long study. So please, bear with me, and we're going to get going, we're going to get going, going, going. Get out your King James Bibles. And the title of this study is The Greatest Commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. With all the soul. Okay. What does it mean to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul? Turn to Mark 12, 29. Once again, since there's a lot of scripture to go over, I'll be turning sometimes, but mostly reading from my notes. You can pause the video and turn to each scripture that I'm, we're going to be calling out. That's what I do when I watch Brethren in Studies. Um... But we're going to be moving because you know me. I love the Lord. I love His Word. And I tend to put a lot of Scripture in here. So we're going to be going through a lot of Scripture. So Mark 12, 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. We're not going into that too much. That's not what this study is about. But the Lord our God is one Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's only but one capital G, God the Father, and only one capital L, Lord Jesus Christ. What you're seeing here is a Godhead verse. The Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. Jesus is God. Fully and completely. He is God the Father manifest in the flesh. Verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment, and the second is like, name, like namely this, thou shalt, love the Lord, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? That's where we get the verse, with all thy soul, love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, with all your soul. How does someone do that? We'll turn to Proverbs 8.36. Turn to Proverbs 8.36. In the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 36. says here, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Now Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I know, I know, we went to Romans. We'll get into that because there's a, there's a false teaching out there and a lot of servants of Satan, I'll call them what they are, Satanists, who claim the Romans road to hell, the Romans road to hell. Those are people that are on their way to hell, and they want to see as many people go to hell with them. Right? There is no Romans road to hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. People who, if we're going to get into this real quick, What's the ultimate proof that someone loves the Lord thy God with all thy soul? Where's your soul going to spend eternity? 1 Corinthians 15, 56 reads, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Romans 3, there it is, Romans again. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The law of sin and death, which you read about in Romans, the law of sin and death is what everybody's under. If you sin against God, you've wronged your own soul. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. Psalms 35.9. Turn to Psalms 35.9. People say, well, you know, I don't know if you can make a good point for this. That, you know, loving God with all your soul is, is where you're going to spend eternity. Psalms 35, 9. <laughs> Slow turner. Psalms 
35 it says, And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. Psalm 62, 1 reads, Truly my soul weigheth upon God. From Him cometh my salvation. Psalm 119, 81. Chapter 119, verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. My hope is in thy word. Where do we find salvation? We'll get to that verse. We'll get to that verse. Romans 8, 2. I know, here he is. Romans again, 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's a law of sin and death that everybody's under. And only God's grace can save you. Do you love the Lord your God with all your soul? They get saved today. I didn't. I know a lot of brothers and sisters of Christ watching this has. James 1.21 Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Remember what we read in Psalms 119.81? My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Where do we find salvation? Through God's word, whether it's the spoken word or it's the written word. It's God's word that, that gives us that promise, that shows us how to get saved. Okay. Where your soul will spend eternity is important here. Because I hear a lot of people say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord with all my heart. I love that. We talked about that. If you haven't watched that video, go watch it. I love the Lord with all my soul. Okay, did you get saved God's way? Did you follow the proper plan of salvation to find God's grace through faith? Well, no, no, I do with things my way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my path. An old study that we got to do together, Brother Sis Christ, was finding the, the title of that study was Finding the Back Door? Question mark. Because everyone's always trying to find a back door. They don't want to go through the front door. They don't want to do things God's way. Where is your soul going to spend eternity? That determines whether you love God with all your soul. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. Matthew 7.13 Matthew 7.13 Matthew chapter 7 Verse 13. Enter ye in in the straight gates. Straight gate. One, singular. I said S. I put an S when there was no S on there. Gate, singular. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein at. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. We're going to be reading that one a lot. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Where are you going to spend eternity? That determines, ultimately, that's the biggest evidence. Do you love the Lord your God with all your soul? Where is your soul going to spend eternity? Well, I'm going to do things my way. You know, this false gospel that's out there, the biggest false gospel I see that's, that's so popular in this wicked world is called easy believism. Now, people will say, well, if I'm not for easy believism, I'm for works. No, I'm not for works. You can't earn, you can't obey the Levitical laws. We just read, for all have sinned. There's no one that can keep the Levitical laws except Jesus Christ. And the works there that the Bible's talking about when we get to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, you know, 10, the, the verse they like to ignore, they like to pretend that it doesn't exist, these easy believism, all right, the works it's talking about there, it's talking about keeping the Levitical laws. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll, we'll get into that. Because breathing's not a work, but now it is. That's a work. Anything They're making all things works when that's not what the Bible's talking about. Okay, It's talking about keeping the Levitical laws in order to be saved. Nobody can keep them. I couldn't. If you're truly saved and born again, watching this, brothers and sisters of Christ, you admit you couldn't. Okay. But if any man love God, then the same is known of him. Where are you going to spend eternity? Okay. True love for God with your soul is obeying the gospel. 
Remember we talked about true love for Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh, and the flesh is keeping his word. What's the command today? Obey the gospel. Having Jesus' righteousness imputed to you, wearing the breastplate of righteousness. Be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. James 1.21. I'm going to start there. James 1.21. Wherefore, lay, we're going to go through it again. James 1.21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, superfluity, I always have a hard time with that word, superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with the meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Okay? And here we get, and then we get back to Romans. You know, the Ro they call it the Romans road to hell. I'm telling you, anybody that says Romans road to hell, stay away from them. I don't say that lightly, brother, says Christ. I don't just jump up and down and say, stay away from everyone. I disagree with the things that Peter Ruckman put out. I never told anybody to stay away from Peter Ruckman. I disagree with Brian Denlinger, but I never told people to stay away from Brian Denlinger. I disagree with uh, Sam Gipp, David Daniels, but I've never sat here and said, stay away from that person. The only time I really sit down and say stay away from somebody is when they're not a King James Bible believer, they're promoting Bible perversions, or they're promoting a false gospel. Those are the two biggest areas where I really say, hey, you need to stay away from that person. They'll really, if you're truly saved, they're going to mess you up. If they're trying to keep get this away from you, they're definitely trying to mess you up. If they're trying to get you to regret the true plan of salvation you got saved off of from the scriptures, and go for a false gospel, they're trying to mess you up. They're also trying to keep people from getting truly saved and born again. They're trying to keep people from loving the Lord thy God with all their heart, and their soul, and their mind, and their strength. Because this just tells us how to do it. And, and the Satan is just trying to take this out of your hands. So when you got someone who claims, oh, I'm a Bible believer, I'm one of you, and they say, well, be careful, the Romans rode to hell, you're dealing with a Satanist. Pure and simple. Satanist. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. No wonder they don't like Romans for salvation. But they have not all obeyed. It's got their number. It's pointing them out. Those people that say Romans rode to hell, for they, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. This is them that, that God's talking about. For Isaiah saith, Lord who hath believed our report. They'll ignore Romans when it comes to salvation. Just ignore Romans. We'll grab things like, you never hear them say, brothers and Christ, they'll say the Romans rode to hell, but you never hear them say the Corinthians rode to hell. But they'll grab verses from Corinthians for salvation. You never hear them say Ephesians rode to hell, because they'll grab verses from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But when it's that pesky Romans that really, really push repentance as it applies to salvation, where they have to you know, crucify the old man at the cross, give their life to Jesus Christ. Oh, we can't do that. We love our sin. We love the world. No wonder they say Romans wrote to hell. Right? But we read there, they don't obey the gospel. Our command for everyone today is to obey the gospel. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's what they're trying to do away with in Romans. When Romans hits really hard, proving that repentance comes before salvation, we'll get to those verses, they'll say it's the Romans' road to hell because they don't want to go to heaven. They love death. Remember what we read up there? But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me, Romans, Romans' road to hell, his word, hate me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he said, sanctify them through the truth, thy truth, thy word is truth. You have capital W word, Jesus Christ. You have the lowercase w word, the written word. They hate me. They love death. They love death. They don't want to get truly saved and born again. They can't let go of this wicked world. 2 Corinthians 4 3. 2 Corinthians 4 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Remember what the Bible says? If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant still. I try to preach the truth. I, I'm getting ahead of myself again. The number one people that I deal with when it comes to trying to reach them for Jesus Christ is professing Christians or people of false religions to have a profession of faith in a Jesus Christ. But reaching them for the real Jesus Christ is so hard. 
The Bible says um, that they have the knowledge, and that's all they have. They don't have faith. They have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better if they had not known the way of righteousness. So that when you come to him, come to those people, their hearts aren't already hardened. They're not already fixed on death, going to hell. I'm going my direction, and I don't care what you say. I'm already going my direction. I found a back door to heaven. I don't care what you say. I found a back door. And one of those biggest things is you, you feel free to uh, uh, do your religion, and I'll, I'll, I'll practice mine. You practice yours, I'll practice mine. We can all get along. Like we're all going to the same place. We're not. There's only one way to heaven. We read that. There's only one way. Only one gate. There's only one way into heaven. You mean? But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God, lowercase g God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. You know what image is? It's the body. It's physical. It's something you can see. Jesus is the body of God. God the Father is the soul. Jesus is the body. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. Body, soul, spirit. We're made in his likeness. I have a body, soul, spirit. You have a body, soul, and spirit. Our body, soul, and spirit is not like God. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit were made in his likeness. Okay? But the image here is Jesus is the body of God. Jesus is God. Body and soul are connected. Once again, Godhead verse. Not a Trinity verse. Not a pagan Trinity verse. A Godhead verse. Let's go back a little bit. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And that light, there's life in that light. Right? Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. When you have a lot of those people that preach easy believism, and they try to tell you Romans road to hell, the Romans road to hell, they preach themselves. We, for we preach not ourselves. I'm not preaching myself. I'm preaching the Word of God. And I'm not handling the Word of God deceitfully, like they do. I'm not wrestling the Scriptures to my own destruction, like they do, when they say Romans road to hell. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We want to see people get saved. I want to see people get saved. I want to see false converts become true converts. I want to see lost people get saved. I also want to see brethren that have fallen get back up to a standing position. How do we do that? By pushing this. Are you starting your day with your word, the Word of God and ending your day with the Word of God? Are you staying in prayer? Praying every morning? Start your day with prayer, end your day with prayer. Stay in this book. Pray to God to open this book. You're following good preachers, but sometimes preachers can make mistakes. Sometimes you can be deceived and you're watching a wolf in sheep's clothing. Someone lying to you and deceiving you. But if you keep at this and you keep praying to God, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and abradeth not. If you keep seeking God and saying, Lord, please show me the truth. I want the truth. God will show it to you. Not the truth that you want. Someone does, if you come to God saying, I want to see my truth. I want to see what I want to see. God ain't going to show you anything. You come to God and say, Lord, you show me what you want me to see. I want your truth. Not my truth. Not the world's truth. Not my wisdom, the world's wisdom, Satan's wisdom. Because they're not truths. My truth isn't truth. God's truth is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay. Isaiah 6.10 Isaiah 6.10 in the Old Testament Isaiah 6, I'm sorry, 61.10 Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord My soul, there's our soul again My soul shall be joyful in my God Why is the soul joyful? For he hath clothed me with a garment of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As the bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, 
and a bride adorned herself with her jewels. And we're going to talk about Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us. Our garment of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. What's he re what's so rejoicing in? Salvation. God saving him. Who's God saving us from? You know who God saved this man right here from? This man right here. This wicked body of flesh. He saved me from myself. No matter how hard I tried, I was going to hell. Okay. 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to get into the salvation message. Please, I've, I've given gospel tracts to people. People think that once you're saved, we're done with the salvation message. Yeah, I'll, I'll witness to people from time to time, but I don't need to watch any more studies on salvation. I, we always need to stay up on this book. We always need to keep hiding this book in our heart because our flesh is trying to kick it out. The world's trying to come in and get us to kick it out because we, we're the ones that kick it out. The world can't force us. The flesh can't force us once we're saved. We're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. So if we, if we kick it out, it's us kicking it out. We're allowing the flesh to kick it out. We're letting the world come in and talk us into kicking it out. Satan comes and whispers in our ear. You know, having teachers, having itching ears, tells us what we want to hear, offers us things of the world, like he did Jesus when he was tempting Jesus. He offers us things of the world to tempt us to kick this out of our heart. To get us to put this down. That's why it's so important to stay in this book and keep it in your heart. doesn't matter how many times you've, you've read about the gospel or have gone over the gospel. Do it again. Eternal security. Do it again. Dispensational teaching. Do it again. Pre-time of Jacob's trouble. Catch away the body of Christ. The Bible calls it the day of Christ and that blessed hope. Study it again. Okay. Keep it fresh in your hearts, brothers and sisters Christ. Don't lax. When you lax, it starts disappearing. I remember a brother in Christ, he hadn't preached the gospel in so long, he was doing an amazing study, and he got into a part of the study where the gospel got brought up, and he started to preach the gospel a little bit, and he started fumbling over himself. He couldn't remember the verses. He hadn't preached the gospel in a while. And in the end, he just quit and said, you know what, I have a gospel message on my channel, just go watch the gospel message. Maybe he needs to be preaching the gospel a little bit more instead of relying on one message. He needs to take time every once in a while to preach the gospel. Go through the passages over and over and over. Keep them fresh in your hearts. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Where is your soul going to spend eternity, brothers and sisters of Christ? That determines whether you love God. What's the true plan of salvation? Because I start talking about, they talk about the Romans road to hell. Turn to Ephesians 1.12. They love Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians 1.12. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 12. That we should be the praise of His gl glory who first trusted in Christ. Where does it start? At salvation. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Where are we going to spend eternity? Brothers and Christ, we're looking for that blessed hope. The day of Christ, where we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. Why? Because our soul loves God. We trust His Word. We follow the true plan of salvation. We're sealed into the day of redemption. We're looking for that day of redemption. Let's talk with the brother in Christ. My soul is redeemed. My spirit's redeemed. But this wicked body of flesh isn't. We got to play. Uh, Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Could that place be our new bodies? Because sometimes when people talk about where it says, in my, Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. People say, well, those are mansions. Yeah, but your body is referred to as, the, as a temple for the Holy Ghost. Your body is a building. 
could that Jesus be in preparing a place for us, our new bodies? Or, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it could be, or it could be that, and he's actually preparing another building up there in heaven. But more than anything, I lean towards more, we're getting new bodies. He's preparing a place for us. Mm -hmm. But we see that who first trusted in Christ, that that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, this has to be preached. And what does Satan not want to do? He doesn't want this preached. Why is that? Because he wants to see as many people go to hell. He, Satan, I've slipped up and I've said wrong things, so for, please forgive me, brother, says Christ. Satan can never send anybody to hell. I remember slipping up and saying that. Well, Satan wants to see, send as many people to hell as possible. I slipped up and said that. You know, it's a babe in Christ. And sometimes it's bad habits. We hear other men of God say things wrong, and it becomes something that, like traditions of men, we always say it this way, and you catch yourself saying it. And as you study the Bible, you go, wait a second. Satan has no power to send anybody to hell. God runs hell, not Satan. God sends people to hell. But Satan wants to see as many people go to hell as possible. He wants to deceive as many people and see as many people go to hell. Remember we read, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go there and at. The Lord KG, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. When someone rejects Jesus Christ, Satan can get their hooks in them. And it becomes harder and harder for them to get saved. They can still get saved. But it gets harder the more they reject Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter Ruckman has this, uh, The Wasted Life, a good uh, chalk talk talking about the wasted life, a man that just rejects Jesus Christ his whole life. And as it goes along, it's easier and easier to reject Jesus Christ and put off salvation. Satan also gets his hooks, because we were talking about that, about false converts, where he deceives them into thinking that they're going to get to go to heaven when they're not because they didn't follow the true plan of salvation. Remember, it had been read if they had not known the way of righteousness. The latter end is worse than the beginning. It's better to come across somebody who has no knowledge whatsoever of salvation or heaven than to come across someone that's part of the false religions that has uh, this self-perception of, I'm right, I'm not going to listen to you. Not that the Word of God is right, they're right. They're not going to listen to you. So what's the, we're going to go through this plan of salvation. What's the first step in salvation? Fearing God. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom. I, I always, if I was a teacher, I'd ask, what's the beginning of wisdom to my class? Wait for an answer. What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's the end of wisdom? Keeping God's commandments. And all they that keep thy commandments. When you fear God, you keep his commandments. When you're not keeping his commandments you realize you're not fearing God. They go hand in hand. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God. The end of wisdom is keeping His commandments. Now we just read, for there are none, there's none right, we've read that all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's another verse that says, there, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay? We fear God, we try to keep His commandments, but nobody's been able to keep His commandments completely. And if you break so much as one of His commandments, you're now under the law of sin and death. What do you do? Repentance. And the lost world hates this, brothers of Christ. They hate biblical repentance. They do everything they can to make it something else. I was deceived. I was a false convert most of my life. I supposedly got saved at 12. I had an NIV book that I ended up getting rid of. When I got a zeal for the Lord at the beginning, I got rid of all my Bible perversions and just grabbed a King James Bible and I cling to this book with all my heart. I'm taking this and hiding it in my heart. Now that I'm older, it's like you don't have to do that, but I was just, I only wanted the truth around me. I've been fed lies in these Bible buildings with these Bible perversions all my life and I didn't get saved till 35 to 36. All my life, so I'm 12 years old, I've been lied to. I just wanted the truth. I just wanted the truth. And when I was a false convert, they were telling me that repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. That's not what the Bible says repentance is. Some people say, well, repentance is just a change of mind. Well, one of the definitions of repentance is a change of mind. We've done a word study on this, brothers and Christ, repentance. 
If you want to go watch that, go watch that. We did worship and repentance. When God repents, he has a change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. They don't want you having a change of heart. They try to destroy what true biblical repentance is. It's something that happens here. And they take it from here, and they put it up here. They have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the latter end is worse than the beginning. The better they had not known the way of righteousness. They want to put it up here. They want you to have all this head knowledge. But they don't want it to hit here. Someone said, a great man said once, that you can miss heaven by 13 inches. It's up here, and it never makes it down here. You have the knowledge, and the Bible talks about, we've talked about this before, having faith unfeigned, the Bible talks about. Well, if it's telling you to have faith unfeigned, what it's saying is, is there's people out there that their faith is fake. It's counterfeit. It's not real. It's just head knowledge that's never made it down here. How does it get down here? 2 Peter 3.9 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. They cut out true biblical repentance that happens here, and they place it, replace it with a false repent a repentance that happens here. I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating it. I'm not just making something out. You're just making, a, what is it, a, uh, a molehill out of an anthill. You know, I'm, I'm just making it bigger than it really, no, it is serious. They're taking true biblical repentance that happens here and making it up here. They're also doing away with it. Oh, repentance is a work. Repentance is a work. They've gotten so bad that they've shown their true colors that they even say prayer is a work. Talking to God is a work. Psalms 34, 8. Psalms 34, 18. I'm sorry. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. You say, well, it doesn't say repentance. No, it doesn't. But that's a good example of repentance. Good definition of repentance. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. You come to God broken. Not just with the knowledge, because some people say repentance is just admitting you're a sinner. The ABCs, A is admit you if you're a sinner. I've, come, I've said this a lot of times in my testimony and, and talking about the gospel. I've come across a lot of people that admit they're sinners. But they love their sin. They ain't letting go of their sin. They have no problem with their sin. Did they follow step one? A, B, C, A, admit. They admitted. But did they truly repent? Absolutely not. There's more to repentance than just admitting you're a sinner. You're not doing anything that everyone else, the lost world does. The lost world admits they're sinners. Yeah, I'm a bad person. Yeah, I've done bad things. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but who is? You know? Psalms 34, 18, we read that. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saith such that be of a contrite spirit. You come to God, they always push this. We're all sinners. The world is sinners. When you're leading someone to Christ, it's not about the world. You can read the verse like I did, for all have sinned and come to the short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But you need to get that person on a personal one-on-one -on -one level with God, and you need to make sure it's that person. Are you a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner? on your way to hell, and deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. And they have to be broken in a contrite spirit. Having sorrow, that's the key. Godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow, godly sorrow. Turn to 2 Corinthians 7, 9. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. And notice who this is being written to. It's written to the Corinthians where Paul, and we're going to get to that, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, where Paul decides that, you know what, I don't think some of you got saved. 
I'm just going to preach the gospel to you again. And he does. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Making sure I had the right address. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. The change of heart is you go from sin is good to now sin is bad. And now you have sorrow for that sin. Before you had you loved the sin, that fleshly love for sin. Now you have sorrow for it. You hate it. Loving sin, hating sin. Okay with sin, not okay with sin. Fleshly fun with sin, to sorrow because of your sin. And well, who's that sorrow towards? We're going to keep reading this. Sorrow to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. Who are you sorry towards? God. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. This isn't even in Romans. But they reject it. The people who claim Romans road to hell, they reject this. This is in uh, Corinthians. So it must be the Corinthians road to hell. But then why don't you say Ephesians road to hell? We're going to get to Ephesians. Well, they love Ephesians. Why don't you say Ephesians road to hell? Because they grab what they want and they throw everything else out. That's not how we're supposed to be. That's not someone who obeys the gospel. They take everything that God has to say about plan of salvation for today, the gospel that's for today, that was revealed to Paul. They take all of it and make sure they follow every step. Every step. What's the first step? You start fearing God, and you come to Him in repentance. Because of your sins, you're on your way to hell. And you have sorrow in your heart. It says right here, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. You know what that means? That means it comes before salvation. You have to go through repentance to hit salvation. To salvation. Not to be repented of. Nobody who's truly born and saved again will ever, ever say, I was wrong for repenting. I was just so wrong. Not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world work at death. That's what prevents people from getting saved. Why they are working so hard to take repentance out? The sorrows of the world. They love the world. They love their sin. They love wickedness. They don't want to give it up. They don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ at the cross. They, they love how Jesus gave his life for them. He, he gave his life for the world, not for them, for the world. Jesus only gave his life for them if you gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. Humbling yourself. Come to him broken in a contrite spirit, having true biblical repentance. Throwing that old man at the foot of the cross. This old man's a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on his way to hell, and he deserves to go to hell for sinning against you, O Lord. Take this life. It's, I'm worthless. I'm worthless. And God goes, okay, give me that life at the cross, and I'll give you a new life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The new birth the new life. Jesus is the light of the world, and in that light is life. He gives us a new life. What prevents people from getting saved? Sorrows of the world. Evidence that your soul, that you love the Lord your God with all your soul, is did you follow the true plan of salvation to make sure that your soul gets to spend eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh for all eternity? This isn't works. This all happens here. You're not doing anything physical. Have I actually said you had to do something physical in order for repentance to work? It all happens here. I'm still in this wicked body of flesh. It's spiritually speaking, we're throwing the old man at the foot of the cross. You, you want salvation? You go to the cross. You go to Calvary. You want God's love? You go to the cross. You go to Calvary. People don't want to go to Calvary. They know of Calvary. They're looking at it from a distance, from afar off. They have the knowledge of Calvary, but they don't actually want to go to Calvary and throw that old man at the foot of the cross. 
and let Jesus Christ, God the Father, manifest in the flesh, God Almighty, give you a new life. Because they can't seem to let go of the old man. They can't seem to let go of this world. The sorrows of the world worketh death. What did we read in Psalms over there? But he that sinneth that sinneth against me, Psalms 8, or Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs 8, 36. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. They love the world. The Bible says that um, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Another sign of someone who's false, who never repented. They can't let go of this world. Right. Now, brothers, says Christ, can we struggle? Can we stumble and fall? Can we start trying to resurrect the old man? Like trying to go back to the world a little bit? Paul warns us. Evidently, it's possible because Paul warns the brethren about resurrecting the old man. So there was people trying to resurrect the old man. Is it possible to stumble and fall as a Christian? Absolutely. But someone who truly gets saved initially says, I'm done with the world. I want you, Lord. I'm done with this wicked body of flesh. I'm done with the old man. I want to be that new man. I want that new life that you can, only you can give, Lord. Only you can give. Only you can save me. You come to God in true biblical repentance. And I always just say this. It's just simple. You come to God fearing Him because you know, you understand that you're on your way to hell because of sin. Your sins. Not the world's. Your sins. And you have sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. And you fall on your knees and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I deserve to go. Have mercy on me, a sinner. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What's the next step? Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not the head knowledge. The belief where it's true faith. It takes faith to repent, going through faith and repentance, going through faith and belief, going through faith and confessing, going through faith and asking God to save you, and that He can save you. Okay. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So you've repented, and that's what we preach, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to come to God broken. You need to stop going about to establish your own righteousness. Well, I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. Basically, I'm a good person. One thing I wanted to mention that I almost forgot is uh, one of the videos I like about Peter Ruckman is the five surprises in hell. And one of the surprises is that it's real, that it lasts forever, because people have been told hell doesn't last forever. It's just the grave. It's just annihilation. No, it lasts forever. It's eternal torment. But one of the surprises is that there's going to be good people down there. There's going to be good people in hell. Well, I'm a good person. Have you sinned so much as once? Well, yeah, but, but you know, we all sin, you know, but I'm not, I'm not that bad of a person. You're not dealing with someone who's broken. Remember the Pharisee versus the, the um, publican? Publican smote on breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Where the Pharisee's up there, well, I'm not like other men are. He's not denying being a sinner, but he's, like you said, admit you're a sinner. No, he's not denying he's a sinner. He's just saying, I'm just not like other men are. You know, like this publican. You know, I do this for you, Lord, and I do that works. I'm not like they are. I'm a good person. My good deeds can outweigh my bad deeds. It doesn't work that way. If you so much as sinned once against God, once, you're on your way to hell. You're under the law of sin and death. You need to come to God broken. And only by coming to God broken does your heart say, I need to be saved. I need salvation that only God can give. Lord, what must I do to be saved? I don't want to go to hell. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15.1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Are saved. Not being saved. Are saved. We read, we read about that being sealed until the day of redemption. But ye are saved. 
if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, if you keep in memory. In other words, he's not saying that you're being saved. He's saying you are saved if you follow the true plan of salvation. Did you? Because he's doubting the Corinthians, the carnal Corinthians. He's doubting their salvation. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Head knowledge? We call it head belief. Believed in vain. You just have the head knowledge. For I deliver unto you first of all how which also I received, how that Christ died and was buried and rose again, on the cross and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. No, what does it say there? How Christ died for our sins. People say repentance isn't even here. How Jesus Christ died for our sins. I'm raising my voice. Maybe they'll hear me if I raise my voice a little bit more. For our sins. If you come to God saying, I don't have a problem with my sins, then you don't truly believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Sins is a problem. Sin puts you under the law of sin and death. Sin is what's sending you to hell. God's sending you to hell because of your sins. It's a big deal. Did you come to God broken and having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God? Then you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. I don't know why that's so hard for these people. They reject repentance and say, that there's no repentance here. How that Christ died for our sins. They love death. They don't want to get saved. Our sins according to the scriptures. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you read in the Gospels how Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It says according to the Scriptures how Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures proving that He is God Almighty. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. You believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. What he went through on the cross is what you should have gone through. You should have been nailed up there on that cross, not Jesus Christ. He went through that for you, brothers and Christ. He went through it for me. Those of us who are truly saved and born again, come to God broken, He went through that for us. Those who would come to God His way. You want God's love? You want salvation? You've got to go to the cross. You have to go to Calvary. Broken. With a broken and contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against Him. That should have been me on the cross. Every time I see, I'm not for images of Jesus Christ, but sometimes I come across images of them putting Jesus on the cross. I look at that and go, I deserve that. I deserve to be on that cross, not Jesus Christ. He was innocent. He was perfect. He didn't do anything wrong. I did. And how he was died and rose again according to the scriptures. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the second step. First, fearing God and coming to him in repentance. Second step, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Finished work. He rose from the dead. He, he completed, what is it? He fulfilled, that's the right word. He fulfilled the law of sin and death. Somebody had to pay for it. Somebody has to pay for your sins. It's either going to be me that pays for my sins or Jesus Christ. Somebody has to pay for it. The law of sin and death has to be fulfilled. There's a payment that has to be paid. Somebody has to pay it. But this is Christ. We came to God broken, seeking Jesus. Lord, can you pay it? I can't pay it. Can you do it, Lord? Can you save me? Yes, He can. Well, I believe you saved me, Lord. That's believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The blood was shed was God's blood, and that blood washed my sins away. I now belong to Jesus Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus. Let's keep going. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, 5. Remember what it says how Christ died for our sins? How He died? 
and for our sins. According to the scripture, for our sins, you go into the scripture, comparing scripture, that's where you get repentance. How he died? Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You can read more detail in the Gospels. He was beaten within an inch of his life. He had his beard ripped out. He was whipped and bled out. When he died on the cross, it's because he had, he had bled out. People were just... People who weeks before were saying, Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna in the highest! Now they're saying, crucify him! They're spitting at him, cursing him. And he was all alone. Even his apostles fled. He was all alone. He went through that alone to pay for my sins. And if you're saved and born again watching this, he did that to pay for your sins. Okay. How he died. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.23 1 Corinthians 1.23 But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Remember the Jews were always looking for signs and wonders, signs and wonders. Show us a sign, show us a sign. And Jesus said he's not going to give many sign, but the sign of Jonas. If you know the story of Jonas, he was in the belly of a fish, a big fish, not a whale, a big fish. God prepared that fish just for Jonah. Is anything too hard for God? Well, we don't understand it, so we're going to make it a whale. People have a hard time trusting the word of God. It says big fish. But he was in the belly of the fish for three nights and three days. Three days and three nights. That was the sign that he gave him. And unto the Greeks foolishness, because we seek wisdom. Why would, why would anybody do that? That's just stupid. Why would someone pay for the sins of the world? Why would someone put their life on the line for people he doesn't even know? Well, he's God Almighty. He knows everybody. But for us, we try to seek wisdom. We try to analyze it and say, Try to make sense of it with man's wisdom, world's wisdom. We have to come and broken and say, you know what, Lord? I know nothing. I'm wrong. You're right. You know everything. Okay. Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Jesus, remember, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Call here is God has a set way to get saved today. God's always dealing with man through the whole Bible, saving man by His grace. And repentance is there in every dispensation. Why would this one be any different? You have to come to God in repentance. And finding God's grace, we're not going to get into this too much, there's different Gospels in the Bible, in different dispensations. But God has a specific Gospel today. Paul's the Apostle to the Gentiles. He's given us the Gospel for the time of the Gentiles. That's what this time period is called. From the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. It's called the time of the Gentiles. Why? Because salvation is now no longer of the Jews, which Jesus said in the Gospels for the Kingdom of Heaven Gospel. Now he's saying that salvation, we're going to do a new Gospel, and this Gospel is going out to the world. Salvation goes out to the world. Anybody can get saved. Anybody can. Are you, that call there is, are you following the plan of salvation? Or are you being deceived by men that stand up and go, Romans road to hell, the Romans road to hell. Repentance is a work. Prayer is a work. All you need is the knowledge. I mean, faith. Knowledge. I mean, faith. And you see right, some of us see right through and point them out. They're just talking about the knowledge. They're not talking about faith. They're lying. Their faith is fate. It's feigned. It's fake. If you skip repentance, and you don't, we're going to keep going about confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you, you're not saved. You're part of an organized religion, you're part of a club somewhere, you're not saved. If you've never come to God broken in repentance, believe, and then believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Both the Jews and Greek called. Called there is not talking about, uh, I forgot what it's called, but... My brain, brain slips sometimes on names. But um, where people are saying that you're destined to be saved or you're destined to go to hell. Okay? Calvinism. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Calvinism. Okay? That's not proving Calvinism. That's saying that God has a specific way that he called people to get saved. There's only one way to heaven. 
There's only one door. Jesus says, I am the door. There's only one door. There's only one way to heaven. The true plan of salvation for today that Paul was revealed to Paul. We get it in Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians. We get it in the Pauline epistles. Be careful of people that they don't, they always just go to John 3.16, John 3.16, John 3.16, and they can't seem to quote from the Pauline epistles to save their life. Watch out for those. I've quoted John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him, He says He's the door, but that the world through Him might be saved. Did you go to Jesus Christ at the cross and bro in a broken and contrite spirit in repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross? That God's blood was shed, His blood can wash your sins away? That He rose again the third day proving that He is God? But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, I say that a lot, the wisdom of the flesh, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of Satan. Those aren't wis the real wisdom, they're counterfeits. They're just telling you what you want to hear and appealing to the flesh to get you away from God's wisdom. Where do we find God's wisdom? Here. What opens this book to you? The Comforter. Know what Jesus said? God, after I go, God, after his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension up, God's going to send the Comforter. When you get saved and born again, you get the Holy Spirit, and He opens the book to us. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and if not. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So we have repentance as the first step. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is the second step. And remember, this is all happening here. You get told it up here, and you start thinking about it, but eventually it's got to make its way down here, when you come broken. You get told, when I first was told, you're a sinner. Well, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. When I was a false convert, and I was like, well, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I, I'm not perfect, I've made mistakes. I know I've made mistakes, you know. The Bible talks about who knoweth a uh, man save the spirit of a man. Right? You know, you, there's no excuse, there's nobody out there that they can talk themselves out of conviction, they can talk themselves into de being deceived. I'm perfect. But when you first start out, you know you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. I know I did things wrong. But it was up here. I was just told, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Just say this little prayer and you're in. And it's like, no, okay. hey. It was just up here. But at some point in my life, I came to God broken. And it got down here. And that's when I truly got saved. Not when it was up here. When it got down here. And it's not meant to make people doubt their salvation. That's my experience. At 35, I got told the Bible version issue. 35 to 36, I got told the Bible version issue. I got told the, told the true plan of salvation, which I'm telling you now, that I wasn't told in these Bible buildings, these false, using Bible perversions. And that's when I said, Lord, I never came to you broken. I know about what you did on, for me on the cross. I know about it. I know the story of Jesus Christ. I, I go around and I talk to brothers of Christ. I go out there trying to witness for Jesus Christ. I haven't come across one person who's never heard the story of Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross. It seems like today in this wicked world with all the false religions, we're in the last days. We're getting ready to be called up home. Everybody's heard it. I've known it. But you know what, Lord? I never come to you broken. I mean, look at my life. I look like the world. I talk like the world. I act like the world. Look at all the... Now that I know this is your perfect written word, I started doing, following some studies by a brother in Christ. And I was like, wow, my life is really wicked. Why do I look like the world and act like the world and talk like the world and live like the world? And I'm indulging in so much sin and wickedness. Doing things the world's way. Why is my flesh in charge? I never came to God broken. I had the head knowledge, but it wasn't faith. And that day, I'm telling you, brothers, that day when I learned the truth of the true Bible version issue, that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word, and, and someone preached the true plan of salvation to me out of this book, my life changed forever. I was never the same.
I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. Getting ahead of myself. True biblical repentance leads to true faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And they both happen here. Here. Not here. It's not works. I can say that a million times, but you have to come to the knowledge of the truth that it's not works. There is no Romans road to hell. That's a Satanist trying to keep you from getting saved. You need to follow the plan of salvation that God laid out for us. What's the next step? I fall on my knees in repentance, having sorrow in my heart for my personal sins that I've sinned against God, fearing God because he's going to send me to hell for my sins and I deserve to go there. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How that Christ died for your sins, according to the scripture, was buried and rose again according to the scripture. How he died and that he died for our sins. Next step is confess both in prayer. This is where like the Romans road to hell really sinks in. They don't want you confessing both in prayer. The Satanists out there, they don't want you asking God to save you. Oh, you just, you know, head belief. You have head belief. We don't want you to come to God broken. We don't want you to have repentance. We don't want you to pray. We just want you to have the knowledge and be part of an occult. Be part of these Babel buildings. Be part of organized religion. Be part of a, a social club. Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It means you have to go through confession to reach salvation. That confessing both your repentance and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross in prayer leads to salvation. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do we read here about the heart? If you believe in thine heart that God raised it from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's going to come out here. If you believe here, it's going to come out the mouth. I'm not talking about the head right now, I'm talking about the mouth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. When it hits you here, repentance hits you here, belief hits you here, the next step is to fall on your knees before God in prayer, saying, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, and I was on my way to hell, Lord, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, O Lord. I am so sorry for ever sinning against you, Lord. I'm wrong, you're right. Lord, you taught me that through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that was shed on the cross, that blood was shed for me because of my sins and washed my, can wash my sins away. And that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to Scripture, proving that you are, that Jesus is God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. You confess that in prayer. It comes from the heart. You know these people that say the Romans rode to hell? They're ashamed of the true plan of salvation. They're ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed that they love death. They don't love life. They love death. I'll, we'll go through it again. Proverbs 8, 36. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. When they hate the true plan of salvation, they love death. You're on that knees and you're confessing both of those in prayer. What's the, what's the next thing? Ask God to save you. They're trying to take that out, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to keep pushing hard when we preach the gospel that you need to ask God to save you. Why? Because you're not ashamed of the gospel and you're proving that you don't deserve to be saved. I didn't earn it. When they take repentance out, they're trying to keep you from having true faith. When they take prayer out, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you, they're saying they've earned, their, they've earned salvation with their faith. And they always try to get on to me. Oh, that's not true. Yes, it is. You've turned faith into works, and you're saying you've earned salvation with your faith. Because if you didn't, why aren't you asking God to save you? Well, no, that's works. That's works. No, it isn't. 
2 Samuel 22, 4. 2 Samuel in the Old Testament, 22, 4. I know a lot of you thought, well, he's going to go to the New Testament. We're going to hit the Old Testament first. 2 Samuel 22, 4. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. This was an old, uh, I don't know if it was a hymn or secular style uh, uh, song, but we used to sing it when I was a lost false convert in these Babel buildings. You know, I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be free? Call, ask. That's what call means, ask. So shall I, you're asking God to save you from your enemies. Psalms 18.3, Psalms 18.3. I will call upon the Lord. Here it is, call upon Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You have it in Samuel. You have in Psalms. Uh, Psalms. King David saying, Lord, save me from my enemies. And you can read all the instances where, 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 G, where David, you had men of God that would go to God and say, Lord, what should I do? Should I go up against these people? Lord, who's going to save us? Lord, save us. we got an enemy that just seems like it's just so overpowering. We're doomed. But Lord, you are God of all. You know, they come to him humble, broken, and calling, saying, Lord, save us. Acts 2.21 And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now one of the biggest lies, I have it in my footnotes, one of the biggest lies that they're pushing, like I said, we showed that they try to change the definition of things. That's how Satan works. He can't do away with this completely, so what he does is he perverts it. We know how he quotes part of Scripture, and then he, he, he ad-libs. He says part of Scripture, and then he ad-libs the other half. So he messes up. He cuts out half the Scripture and ad-libs. Because he can't, can't get rid of this fully and completely. He can't get rid of repentance fully and completely. So, well, you know, that repentance, we'll change the definition. It's just going from unbelief to belief. It's just, you know, a change of mind. You know, we'll change the definition. Here we are, we're talking about call. Those who call upon the name of who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, call here, just, it just means believe. No, it just means believe. So it's, you know, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. So why would you say believe, believe, and believe? That's just repetitive, you know. We only need to say believe once. You see how slick he is, Satan is? How slick these people are? They just took out two fundamental parts of the plan of salvation to find God's grace and deceive the world. Just one belief. It's just head belief. That's it. That's it. That's all. They changed the definition. Call does not mean believe. Call means ask. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you're asking Him to save you. Whatever trouble you're in, you're asking Him to save you. Romans 10, 12. Romans 10, 12. Back to the pesky Romans. The Romans rode to hell. I mean it, brother, says Christ. When someone's not a King James Bible believer, stay away from them. If there's someone who can be a King James Bible believer and they might be messed up somewhere. Maybe lots of somewheres. But if they're a Bible believer, they're a Bible believer. God will work on them. Okay? You can plant seeds. Remember, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. But the second thing that I'd say, the second type of person I'd say stay away from is someone who rejects the true plan of salvation for today. Who does all this stuff? Well, call just means believe. Stay away from that man. He's a servant of Satan. Complete servant of Satan. Romans 10, 12. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Remember? I don't know if you remember this, but in the, in the Gospels, the kingdom of heaven was only for, for the Jews. Jesus said, we know whom we serve for salvation is of the Jews. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now salvation's gone out to the world. The time of the Gentiles. Gone out to the world. Anybody can get saved today. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Remember it says there's neither Jew nor, uh, nor Gentile. Bond nor free. Male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich upon, uh, unto all who call upon him. Lord save me. I don't deserve it. But Lord please save me. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Calling comes before shall be saved. Repentance comes before salvation. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross comes before salvation. Confessing both in prayer and, a and asking God to save you comes before salvation. And God looks at the heart. Is he repentant? Does he have faith, that true belief in the heart? Confessing both in prayer, asking God to save you, humbling himself, I don't deserve it. When you ask someone to help you, someone to save you, I don't deserve it. You're not telling, when you don't ask God to save you, you're basically telling God he has to save you. Because I have that belief, I have the knowledge, you have to save me. No, he does not. No, he does not. You ask God to save you, and God looks at the heart. The Bible talks about how this is a double-edged sword that, that pierces the, th the heart and knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'm sorry, pierces the thunder, asunder, and knows the thoughts and the thoughts and intents of the heart. God looks at the heart. You look at Jesus Christ, you could see what was in men's hearts. God looks at the heart. This man followed the proper steps. He's broken in a contrite spirit. I will gladly gladly save him. How do we know this? Because the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a story in the gospel where Jesus uh, was a city, and one of the apostles, I guess the city rejected him, and one of the apostles said, should we call that fire rain down upon him? And he said, no. For the Son of Man was not sent to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God wants to see people saved. You come to Him broken, the heart. In true biblical repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, uh, confessing both in prayer, I'm a, that your repentance, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, on my way to hell, Lord, I'm so sorry that you had to be on the cross when I should have been there. And I believe in what you did for me on the cross. You confess both, you ask God to save you, and God will gladly save you. But like we said, what's preventing people from getting saved today? The sorrows of the world. They can't seem to let go of the world. The flesh, the world, sin. Coming to God broken. They can't seem to do it. And that's why we see a lot of people going to hell today. They won't follow the proper steps to get saved. And God will gladly save you. He did. Brothers Christ, if you're watching this, if you're a false convert watching this, get saved. Pardon me. Get saved. Like Paul said, I'm a servant for, Je for you, for Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this for the fun of it. I take no joy when I come across somebody that I doubt their salvation when they profess to be one of us, profess to be a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. I want to see people get saved and born again. I want to see people, I'm getting ahead of myself, I, I want to see people get saved and born again. Because what the last step we're going to be talking about is someone who truly loves the Lord their God with all their souls, they want to see other people go to heaven too. We're going to get there. Getting ahead of myself. This is a long one. We're going to push through it. Please bear with me. I pray that you're still with me, brothers and sisters Christ. But someone who truly loves the Lord thy God with all their, your soul is you're going to want to get saved and spend eternity with Jesus Christ. And you want to get saved the proper way. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And now when God saves you, real quick, because I do have to touch on this, you have a changed life. You threw the old man at the foot of the cross. This man is going to hell. This man can do nothing to go to heaven. And I'm throwing, my, throwing at the mercies of God at the foot of the cross. And Paul talks about this. The changed life after salvation... Anybody says that there doesn't have to be a change, you're, look, you're dealing with someone who's a servant of Satan. I'm sorry. You're dealing with someone who's, who's lost their way. I'll, I'll have grace. Someone who might be saved and lost their way. But when they say that there is no changed life, it doesn't have to be any whatsoever, you're dealing with someone who doesn't line up with this book. 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you love God with all your soul? Did you get saved the right way? 
Do you follow God's steps, the proper steps to salvation, or do you try to fall, find a, a back door? You found teachers with each itching ears that told you, Oh, you can go to heaven and have the world at the same time? A back door? No, there are no back doors. When you truly get saved and born again, there's evidence of salvation. And we, we Bible believers get hammered so much by the lost world, mainly by false converts. Nobody who's truly saved and born again is going to fight me on the changed life. Like I said, when, I, when God saved me, when I finally came to the knowledge of the truth, and I had never come to God broken, I had a flesh feeling. Don't be deceived by the flesh feelings in these Babel buildings where the music's playing and, and everyone's getting all fleshly, emotional, fleshly and everything, and crying and uh, tears and uh. That's all emotionally flesh junk. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one coming to God broken. Humbling yourself and having real sorrow in your heart for your personal sins you've sinned against Him. Not being influenced, you're not being influenced by the world, by the flesh, by the fleshly music, by everyone around you. Oh, they're doing it, so I'll do it. You don't do it because someone else is doing it. You don't do it because your parents tell you to do it. You don't do it because you, know, you want to be part of this club. You don't do it because I want to marry this woman or I want to marry this man. You do it because for you and Jesus Christ, you come to Him one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And when you do get saved, there's a changed life. Like I said, when I got saved, when God, God saved me, my life was never the same. Someone who's truly born again, they'll never deny the changed life. When you see people out there, there is no changed life. Oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life. What about the carnal Christian? We have a study on that. Uh, Romans chapter 8, I think it is. It talks about being carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Someone who's lost versus carnally minded are spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. And you have teachers out there, some are false, some are lost their way, they're not lining up with this book, they're saved, but they're not lining up with this book, that teach that that's just two types of Christians. No, that's a lost person and someone who's saved. It's defining the difference. And we've proven that in our studies on that issue. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. There's a changed life. Matthew 7, 14, we read, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They try to destroy, they, take, they try to take this from you. They try to take, when they can't take this from you, they try to change definition of words. They try to prevent people from getting saved. Ultimately, it's on that person to get saved, but they do everything they can to mislead them in the wrong direction. Ravening wolves, they love death. They're on their way to hell and they want to see as many other people go to hell with them. They can't seem to let go of this world. They don't want to, there's some people that don't want to go to hell, but they can't seem to let go of this world. And they're going to wind up in hell. If they can't come to God broken. Verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do they line up with this book? No, they don't. They line up with the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Do they line up with the world, or do they line up with this? The life they're living, their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. You can fail the Lord sometimes as a saved sinner. But your tree is predominantly good fruit when you get saved. Because you're hiding this in your heart and you're living for the Lord. Now I understand this is Old Testament. Talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. But there's instruction rises. Neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. A corrupt tree can put, try to have counterfeit fruit. And they try to get fake fruit out there that looks good. But have you ever seen fake fruit, like the plastic fruit? It looks really good, but can you eat it? No. It's worthless. It's only for looks. Where you've got fr good fruit that you can eat. Right. Corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. That, like I said, this is for the time of Jacob's trouble. This is for the kingdom of heaven. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. 
By their fruits you shall know them. You'll know those that are of God and those that are of the world. This is for instruction righteous. And the reason I say that is because what does the Bible say about today? Can you fail the Lord today? Absolutely. But what does the Bible say? If we confess our sins, this is First John, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. But you see a picture of here of you have a trees with good fruit and you have trees with bad fruit. And how do you discern a good tree from a bad tree? By their fruit. Their works, the the, what we're talking about here, the changed life. My life was never the same. I have my testimony. I started giving up a lot of wicked things. I started looking at everything differently. I started living my life for Jesus Christ. If it pleases God, I do it. If it doesn't please God, I get it out of my life. And, then getting and as I grow closer to God, I, 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 cr I grow farther apart from this wicked world. My lost family members, friends, co-workers, the world, you, you start finding yourself distancing yourself from the wickedness of this world and isolating yourself one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. I was talking to a brother in Christ, I really can't stand being around the lost world that much in these last days. It's just wickedness right before your eyes. You can't even go outside your door and leave, you know, without wickedness right in your face. I like spending all my time with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. What's it talking about? You still have the same wicked body of flesh. What's it talking about is your heart. Your heart, when you were the old man, was about the flesh. You were carnally minded walking after the flesh. Now that you're saved, your heart is spiritually minded walking after the spirit. You're always looking at things through this lens, through these glasses, if you want to say. You look at the world through this, through God's word, by the Holy Spirit. Before, you weren't giving God glory in all things. Now you are. You weren't giving God thanks in all things. Now you are. You're not, before you just talk to yourself, hmm, should I do this? Well, it feels good. If it feels good, do it. Now that you're saved, you go, Lord, should I do this? Lord, is this what you want for me? Behold, all things become new. How you handle things and deal with things in this world, everything changes. It's all based off of God. Your focus is on Jesus Christ. Your eyes are now, when you're lost, your eyes were on the world and the flesh. Now that you're saved, your eyes are on Jesus Christ. Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You don't get saved by circumcision. You get saved by Jesus Christ. You don't get saved by the Levitical laws, works of the law. You get saved by Jesus Christ. Your good deeds don't outweigh your, my good, I don't go do good deeds to outweigh my bad deeds. Well, if I do it like the lost person, if I do enough good works, that'll outweigh, outweigh the bad works, and then that way God will let me go to heaven. That's the old man. The new man says, I'm not doing good works to get saved or to earn heaven. I do good works because my Savior, who is my Lord and my King, commands me to. He says, live this way. Do this. Do that. Don't do that. Cling to this. Stay away from that. The Lord my God commands me and I obey. That's why I do good works. Because I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it to earn salvation. I'm doing it because God saved me and I belong to Him. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, never thee less, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And if the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm yours, Lord. Command me. Tell me how to live. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Sorry, next one. Romans 6.1. Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what, when they take repentance away. They take 
prayer way and you just live however you want to live and just say, I believe in the big guy upstairs. That's why they're doing it. They want you to still be lost and you're trying to hold on to the world. What shall I say then? They try to justify sin. Shall I sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, no, you just, just say you believe in, the, in, the, in, in what Jesus Christ did and you use what Jesus did on the cross as a credit card to justify sin. God forbid! How are we that are dead to sin? The changed life. The man before, the old man, had no problem with sin. The new man does. What Jesus went through on the cross for me because of sin, I don't want to sin anymore, Lord. What am I supposed to do? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You start living the life of Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He tells us, abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Don't, uh, I don't know if we got this in the scriptures, but I was talking to Brother Christ where it talks about don't put things before your flesh to entice the flesh. Okay, get things out of your life that tempt the flesh, that get you to fall away, to get you to fail the Lord. Get that temptation out of your life. I always say your home is the number one place that you can make a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. The abstain from all appearance of evil free place is your home. I call it my sanctuary. I probably shouldn't. But it's a place where I feel safest to praise God. I have no temptations. God's helped me clean up this home and get things out. Right. But every once in a while, something tries to come in and tries to tempt me. Right. We are, how are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in baptism and death, the old man. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The new birth, the new creature in Christ Jesus. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, shall be also in his likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. This body of flesh is not in charge. We can give in, and we can choose to sin, and we can fail, the God, uh, fail God. We can stumble, we can fall. But God picks us back up. Repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. Someone who's lost, the, the, the flesh is in charge. God's not in charge, the flesh is. We should not serve sin. Who are, who are we the servants of? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You get saved. Jesus' righteousness gets imputed to you. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in writing or drunkenness, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provisions, there it is, make not provisions for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't put things around you that's going to tempt you to do things you know is wrong, or to get you to go in the wrong direction, that you know that's not the direction God's calling me to. You don't make provisions for the flesh. 1 Corinthians 8.3, But if the man love God, the same is known of him. So recap again, someone who loves God with all their soul, with all their soul, they're going to repent, they're going to believe, and they're going to confess both in prayer, and they're going to ask God to save them. And after salvation, there's going to be evidence of salvation. There's going to be the new birth. This gets taken, puts in your heart, and live it. That's what loving God is, taking God's word, hiding in your heart, and living it. That's loving God. Loving God with all your soul is you take the gospel, God's true plan of salvation, and you follow it because where you spend eternity determines on where, whether you love God or not. Right. Finally, someone who loves the Lord with all their soul has a desire to see others get saved. See, others get to sp spend eternity in heaven. Their soul, we care about where their soul sp spends eternity. 1 Peter 3.15 but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What is this hope? Titus 2.13 
looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Where we get to spend eternity, we want to see other people spend eternity there. Our love for preaching salvation, the plan of salvation, the gospel. Right? Ephesians 1.12, we read, that we, should to, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom after that ye had believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, where two-thirds redeemed, my body is not redeemed, my soul and my spirit are. We're looking for that blessed hope. We're going to spend eternity in heaven with our Savior. And we're going to have perfect bodies. We're going to begin the new bodies. The redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Where we are going when we die or get caught up in life. That's the blessed hope. That's the hope that we have in us. We came to God in repentance, faith, a belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save us. And when God saved us, He gave us a new life, a new birth, and He sealed us into the day of redemption. Okay. Where are we going to go when we die or get caught up in life? You know, the day of Christ, that blessed hope. And that the lost person on their way to hell can go there too. Here's how, and you preach the gospel to them. Brother and Christ, loving the Lord your God with all your soul is getting saved and being a living witness and a verbal witness to see other people get saved too. Where we're going when we die and we care about where other people are going to go when they die. Right? That's loving God with all your soul. 2 Corinthians 5.18 and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're to preach the gospel. We're to live the gospel. Our heartfelt desire is to see people get saved, not go to hell. 2 Timothy 1.8 Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of men his prisoners, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Afflictions of the gospel? We're going to get into that a little bit more. But no matter what, we preach the gospel. I've seen this a lot in the body of Christ. In these last days, more, less and less people, it seems like, are, are open to the gospel. So people are getting burnt out. Brethren are getting burnt out. Oh, what's the point of putting out gospel tracts? What's the point of putting out gospel tracts? People just tear them up and throw them away anyway. You know, what's the, you know, door-to-door -door gospel tracting, that's not, you know, that's not biblical, you know, and yet Paul preached in people's homes, that's door-to-door, -door. they preached in people's homes. Um, but you know what I'm saying, they just get so dead, a whole street preaching, eh, it just doesn't seem to be effective anymore, so I'm going to quit. Uh, you know, gospel tracking doesn't seem to be effective anymore, so I'm going to quit. Uh, you know, just preaching the gospel all together just seems, well, I made one video. Go watch my salvation video. I made one video, and I'm good. And that's it. And it's just people are, are starting to be lazy. They're starting to give up on the gospel. They're not preaching the gospel with all their heart like they did when they first got saved, or they first when they got first got saved, and some of the men in ministry, when they were first in ministry, I've seen men in ministry where they're really on fire for the Lord, preaching the gospel, living a li preaching living the life of Christ, being a living witness, and preaching the gospel. They had a desire to see people get saved. But over time, that desire starts to fade. And their heart starts to harden when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to preaching the gospel. Brother says Christ, no matter what, we're to preach the gospel. We're to be a living witness and a verbal witness. Even when it seems nobody wants the gospel. To live a life of Christ, we continue to sow seeds. We're to live a life of Christ, no matter what. A living witness and a verbal witness. Right. Why? Because we want to see people get saved? Yes. But do we do it? How do I say this? Do we preach the gospel only because people get saved? Or do we preach the gospel because God commands us to? Let's say you preach the gospel to these people. God says, come over here and preach the gospel to these people, and nobody gets saved. 
Was it in vain? No, because God commanded us to. You're doing what God commands you to do, and that's what matters. Now, if God calls you to, to preach the gospel over there, you're planting seeds of truth, conviction, and the pro someone's going to get saved. If God called you over there, He sent you over there for a reason. I believe somebody's going to get saved. But the point is, is we do it because God commands us to do it. We don't do it because of the results. Oh, it doesn't seem like anybody wants to be saved. Well, then let's just stop preaching the gospel. Uh, no, we need to keep preaching the gospel until God calls us home in death or in life. Okay, we die and God brings us home or the catching away of the body of Christ. 2 Peter 2.18 but the number one, the next few verses, the number one thing I usually face is not people who have never heard the gospel, but it's people that have a profession of faith that's part of a false religion. That's the number one people I deal with. 2 Peter 2.18 For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the, of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them which live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. Right? These are people that I believe are... I believe by this time, Second Peter, uh, doctrinally, this is for the time of Jacob's trouble, but for today, instruction righteousness, you got people that are part of false religions, and they promise you liberty. We can tell you how to get saved when they're lost, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. Oh, they're part of these false religions where you can have the world and be a Christian. You can have the world, your sin and wickedness and worldliness, and still go to heaven. They themselves are the servants of corruption, from whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than the beginning. For it had been better for them... To to not to have known the way of righteousness, then after that they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. The holy commandment. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. The time of Jacob's trouble, we're not going to get into it, the time of Jacob's trouble, but you can get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble as far as a profession of faith, but there's works involved. If you take the mark of the beast or you worship the beast, you can have all the, the belief and, and everything, and the faith, all you, doesn't matter. You go to hell and you burn for all eternity. But for instruction righteousness, brothers and Christ, the number one people, as a warning, the number one people that you're going to deal with when it comes to trying to preach the gospel to, you're not going to come across somebody who's never heard about the gospel, never heard about heaven, never heard about hell, doesn't know what sin is. Okay? Everyone I've ever tried to reach or talk to preaching the gospel, they have some kind of head knowledge. They've already got ideas that lies and deception that were put in their heads by this wicked world, by the false religions of the world, by servants of Satan. Okay. And that's the number one people that we're going to be dealing with in these last days. That one world religion is in the world today. It's already growing big. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15.2 1 Corinthians 15.2 By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I wanted to read that again because you got people that have the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he went through. But they never come to God broken. They never come to God with a broken and contrite spirit, fearing him and throwing the old man at the foot of the cross. They never do that. They just say, well, I have head belief. I believe in what Jesus went through. Well, guess what? The Bible says, if you believe that there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You don't think the devils believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? That Jesus is God? But they ain't about to come to God in, in, in brokenness. In a broken and contrite spirit, humbling, saying, you're right, I'm wrong. Mm -mm. No, they don't. But you can believe in vain. You can just have head knowledge. You skip repentance, your belief is in vain. I've taught this, and people say, well, it's a heresy. It's a... You skip repentance, your belief is in vain, because it's up here, and will never make it down here. 2 Corinthians 11.26 And journeyings often, and perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by my own countrymen, 
and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea. Perils from what? Preaching the gospel. Here's the last, here's the last part here. In perils among false brethren. The number one people I am seeking to get saved is false brethren, because that's what I mainly come across. Someone who has the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but they don't know the true plan of salvation. And when you preach the true plan of salvation, they either reject it, or they've never heard it. They've never heard what real repentance is. Or they have, and they reject it. They never heard that, you know, you've got to ask God to save you because they've been lied to. The prayers will work. You don't pray. They've been lied to. Or they've been told the truth and they reject it. My point is, brothers, I'm trying my best not to give up on brethren out, or brother, false brethren out there. I want to see them get saved. My love, my soul, love the Lord your God with all your soul, wants to see false converts get truly saved and born again. Does you, do you want to see false brethren truly get saved and born again? Or has your heart been hardened? Let them go to hell. Let them go to hell. Let them go to hell. I've come around preachers that are like that. Their heart is very hardened. Let them go to hell. Did you preach the truth to them? What's the point? They don't want it. What's the point? Did you try? No. They just don't want it. Well, we're supposed to try. We're supposed to witness. We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. We're not supposed to give up. If you tried to preach the truth to them and they read, reject the truth, dust the brush off, dust the, was it, brush the dust off your feet and move on to the next city. Okay. If they don't want the truth and you've tried to witness to them and you've planted seeds, move on to someone else. Absolutely. Don't sit there and bow, beat them with the truth because if they don't want the truth, they don't want it. You're now wasting your time. You're now casting that which is holy among the dogs and casting pearls before swine. If they don't want the truth, they don't want the truth. But you're to try to give it to them initially. Have you tried? Some brethren are giving up. Be careful that you're not one of them, brothers and sisters of Christ. That you're still laying out gospel tracts. Yeah, people might pick them up. The reason I like the gospel tract that a brother in Christ in, in Canada made for me is because I fold it where hell's the first thing that sticks up. So they pick it up, there's a picture of hell, for the wages of sin is death, time is running out, and whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. They see that, they can read that as they just glance at it, it plants a seed, even if they throw it away, and don't read the rest of it. But brothers Christ, it's not about them reading it, it's about me doing what God called me to do, called all of us to do, the ministry of reconciliation. And some of the brethren out there have forgotten that. They make excuses. Well, they just take the gospel tract and, and, and throw it away and everything. It's like, uh, no. I mean, yes, they do, but no, that's not why I do it. I don't do it for them. I do it for the Lord first, them second. The Lord first, them second. And there's men in ministry and brethren out there, period, that have forgotten that. We're doing this for the Lord first, my servant, your servant, for Christ's sake. Paul says, I'm your servant for Christ's sake. Him first, the people second. And we forget that we're doing it for the Lord because he commands us to, to be a living witness and a verbal witness. Okay. Now as you preach the gospel there, even though there's false, it talks about false brethren here in 2 Corinthians, it talks about the life of a Christian trying to be an evangelist, but going out and preaching the gospel. It's not easy. There's going to be, there's sometimes you're going to go through trials and tribulations, some hardship. Does that mean you give up? Does it mean that we quit? No matter what, we preach the gospel, brothers and Christ. Why? Because that's, all, that's loving the Lord your God with all your soul. You got saved, you want to see other people get saved. I was lied to and someone stood up and told me the truth. I want to be one of those people that stands up and tells people the truth. I want to see people get saved and born again. Okay. My thing is, like I said, I think I already said this, but you give, I've given gospel tracts to people that they say they're saved, but they hate the fact that I gave them a gospel tract. Their bitterness and hate towards the gospel. If someone gave me the gospel, a gospel tract that was true, not a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, I'd still take it and end up throwing it away or using it to start my fire uh, and the wood stove. 
But if someone actually gave me a gospel tract, I wouldn't be all hateful and snooty and, and, and verbally mean. How dare you give me a gospel tract? You think I'm not saved? How dare you? I'd take it and say, praise God. That's, that's the gospel. Praise God. He saved me. And I turn around and hand that gospel to someone else who needs it. But I've tried giving gospel tracts to professing Christians that I didn't know. I, didn't, I don't know they're a professing Christian. I just hand out gospel tracts. I lay them out places. And they get really mad. Why is that? Why is that? Something in them is telling them they didn't follow the true plan of salvation. Are they, their flesh is saying, stay away from that gospel tract. Stay away from this gospel tract that can lead you to Christ. The world says, stay away from the true plan of salvation. They, you know, Satan definitely does, and his minions. But when you go to preach the truth, you're going to have hardship. Now, then people getting mad at me, is it going to stop me from preaching the gospel and handing out gospel tracts? No. People attacking this channel? No. Does it get me down? Yes. Does it? I'm not going to act like one of those prideful you know, preachers and everything. It doesn't bother me a bit. It does sometimes. It weighs heavy on my heart sometimes, all the attacks. There's times where i got to take a break and spend some time with the Lord and let the Lord strengthen me. Okay, now it's time to get back into preaching the Word. All right? Especially when it's a brother in Christ that's part, of the, that's part of the falling away that turns on you. It's not easy. Standing for the truth and standing for what's right. Being a living witness and a verbal witness. A verbal witness. There's a cost. There's hardship. Galatians 2.4 And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. I'm fighting the lost uh, false religions. I'm struggling with people professing to be brothers in Christ, but they come in. I'm a Bible believer. I'm a Bible believer. And then they say, Beware the Romans road to hell. What are they doing? They're trying to bring you back into bondage. They're trying, to, they're trying to keep people from getting saved. And those that are saved, they're trying to mess you up and try to prevent you from uh, being a witness and getting other people to look to Jesus Christ to save them. They're trying to keep you from preaching the true plan of salvation. They're trying to get you to turn on it. But they profess to be one of us. I'm a King James Bible believer. So then you believe that repentance comes before salvation. No, repentance is a work. Then you're not a Bible believer. You're dealing with the Satanists. Well, prayer is a work. You're dealing with the Satanists. We're having all those people come in, and it, it, it's, it wears on us. Having to deal with people professing to be brethren that are lost, they're fakes, and then dealing with actual brethren that are falling away. Dealing with this lost world with all these false religions, it gets weary. But brother and sister Christ, go spend some time with the Lord and His Word and let Him strengthen you. So you, okay, I'm thank you Lord for strengthening me and get back out into the fight. Put on the whole armor of God. Okay? We're going to get out there and keep being a living witness and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ. Someone who loves God with all their soul wants to see people get saved. Will they all get saved? No. But it's not about them getting saved. Pre like you say, it's not about the numbers. It's about the effort. It's about the action of actually witnessing. That's what matters. And believe it or not, you could witness your whole life, 50 years, trying to witness for Jesus Christ. One person gets saved, it was all worth it. It's not about large numbers. Only one person got saved? Well, that was just a waste of life. 50 years, that was just such a waste of life. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. People are too worried about numbers. How many people are getting saved? Well, we saved this many. Well, we saved that. It's not about numbers. It's about the act of actually preaching the truth, the true plan of salvation. 1 John 2.18 1 John 2.18 Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. Everyone's heard of a Jesus Christ. Everyone's heard of a Jesus Christ, and they've heard the story of what Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, went through. They know the story, and they've heard of a Jesus Christ, but the a Jesus Christ they're getting to accept are the Bible perversions, a lot of these false religions. Even people claiming to be Bible believers. It's like the Jesus you profess is 
no basis in Scripture. He's not the Jesus of the King James Bible. He's the Antichrist of the King James Bible. There are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us. But they all went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Snakes, when it talks about the verse we just read in Galatians, they, brethren unawares brought in. False brethren. They first, the first thing they do, they come in and say, well, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying. But it doesn't take them long for them to start clashing with what you're saying and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and start turning their back on everything. Then you start noticing this false converts. When I was first saved uh, nine years ago, there was a lot of people following some of the ministries that I was following that they were saying, amen, preach it, amen, preach it, like they agreed with what was being preached. And then three or four years later, now they're saying the complete opposite. They're attacking absolute truth. They're tracking the true plan of salvation. They're attacking the Bible version, the King James Bible as being perfect. They're attacking the God, the true plan of salvation. They attack eternal security. They attack dispensational teaching. They attack the imminent return of Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope, the day of Christ. Okay? They start attacking the Godhead of the King James Bible. Well, what happened to you saying, amen, brother, preacher, brother? They were snakes slithering in where they didn't belong. Eventually, their, colors, their true colors come out. Eventually, they do. Whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Once again, brothers of Christ, I read a lot of these verses to open your eyes to say, okay, you're going to struggle. You're going to have people who profess to be brethren get you down. Wolves in sheep's clothing get you down and, and everything. Trying to get you to turn on this book. The number one person I deal with most, though, in these last days is the people with the knowledge of Jesus Christ head belief. But refuse to come in to Him in repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer, and asking God to save them. Evidence of this is the changed life we talked about, the new birth. No evidence, no fruit. I don't think they got saved. There's nothing wrong with having that attitude, brothers of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Don't let them get you down, and don't let them get you bitter. I want to see them get saved. I want to preach the truth to them. They don't want the truth, then I'm done with you, I'm going to move on, and I'm going to keep going until you find someone that wants the truth, that loves the truth. Keep going. Don't give up, brothers, says Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.1 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, they'll use subtlety, the Bible says, through good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple, that people will look to men having teachers, having itching ears. They'll look for people that are men pleasers, that'll tell them what they want to hear. They use good words and fair speeches. Through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is simple. The plan of salvation is simple. It's not complicated. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, and that's what we're fighting, brothers says Christ, a false Jesus, that antichrist spirit. Or if you receive another spirit, that antichrist spirit, the spirit of the world, the Jezebel spirit. Those are the three spirits I think we're fighting more than anything. And they all could be one and the same, just that Antichrist spirit. Okay. But that's what we're fighting. These people are receiving another spirit. And we're going to them and we're trying to break through the hardened heart, the stubborn mind, the pride, the stubborn mindset. I already know what the way to heaven. I'm right. Do you, does your way line up with the book? If you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel, all oh, repentance is just a work. All oh, prayer is a work. They're getting you to, to receive another gospel. If you're a false convert watching this, if you're truly saved and born again, they're getting you to turn on the gospel, the true plan of salvation. They don't want you preaching the true plan of salvation. 
We're going to keep preaching, brothers and sisters. We need to keep preaching the true plan of salvation. We need to stay strong. We need to stay on fire for the Lord. When that fire starts to go out, you know, when you start to get weak, go spend some time with the Lord in prayer and His Word. I like to go out for walks and everything and, and, and nature. Spend time with the Lord in prayer. Take a break. And just spend some time with the Lord. And then get back into the fight. That fire starts blazing again and you get back in the fight. Which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Who's him? Satan. Where's Satan going to end up? The lake of fire. If you don't get the true plan, if they don't get the true plan of salvation, they're going to wind up in hell with Satan. Uh, lake of fire, I'm sorry. The lake of fire with Satan. They're going to go to hell first and they get tossed in the lake of fire. Satan gets tossed into the bottomless pit and then he's let loose for a while and then he's tossed into the lake of fire. We're going to end up, you're going to end up in this, these people are going to end up in the same place that Satan is. And this is what we're fighting. We're at this day and age. It's not that we're fighting lost people that have no knowledge or anything. We're fighting people that are lost that have a knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've got false gospels, false spirit, and they've got a false Christ on the brain. And we're trying everything we can to still witness to them. Don't give up, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't give up. Keep preaching the truth. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep gospel tracting. What do you do when you come across someone you doubt their salvation? Because we're talking about false converts, people that are false religions. When you come to somebody, you're like, wait a minute, I don't think you're saved. What do we do? Do we just turn around and walk the other way? Oh, they, they clearly don't want the truth, so I'm not even going to attempt to preach the truth to them. Remember 1 John 4, 1, believe it, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they have God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. Love, believe not every spirit. So you test the spirits. Do they line up with this book? No, they don't. So you start to doubt their salvation, brother says Christ. What do you do? Brother says Christ, what do you do? Do you just leave them to their fate? Do you just, you know, you see them heading for destruction, do you just let them go? Or do you try to warn them? Okay. Do you preach the gospel to them all over? What did Paul do to the Corinthians? Did he just let them head for destruction? He doubted some of their salvation. Oh, if they go to hell, they go to hell. It's on them. Who cares? No, that's where we get 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He's preaching the gospel to them all over again. Brothers and Christ, you come across somebody that you doubt their salvation. They claim to be a Bible believer, but you start to doubt their salvation. Start talking to them about the gospel. You don't have to hit them up like you're treating them 100% like they're lost, but start getting into conversations about the gospel, repentance, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the cost of sin. Start getting back into the gospel and areas of the gospel. Sin, hell, heaven. Maybe there are brother in Christ that have fallen and they need to be reminded who saved them, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved. Or you might be dealing with a false convert that you can bring to Jesus Christ and see someone truly get saved and born again. I have many false converts tell me I am lost. I am lost and on my way to hell. But they never preach the gospel to me. Why is that? I get people attacking me all the time. Emails uh, under the channel. Not as much these days, but there was a time where I was really getting attacked. You're a heretic. You're lost. You're a servant of Satan. Okay, where's the gospel at? You preach a false gospel, but they don't dare try to teach, they don't try to preach to me the true plan of salvation. They don't have it, but they don't even try to preach the gospel to me. Why is that? You ever notice that, Brother Jesus Christ, when someone attacks you and says, you're a false convert, you're not, you're not saved, you're a heretic, you're a servant of Satan? They don't tend to preach the gospel. And I believe a lot of the attacks I used to get, the attacks kind of disappeared because they know it doesn't get to me. In other words, I'll try to talk to him about something we disagree on the Bible. And if I start, if God starts opening my eyes, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. If God starts opening my eyes saying, hey, wait a second, I don't believe that person's saved. I don't believe it took because they must have skipped a step in the plan of salvation. Something's not right. They could be saved. I don't, if something's not right, what do I do? I go and link the gospel to them. I go straight back to the gospel. I go back to the first step that matters. The gospel of our salvation. It either wakes up somebody who's, who's truly saved and born again that's fallen. It wakes them up. 
gets them to repent, forsake, get their heart right with the Lord, get back on the right path, get back to standing and fighting for our Lord and Savior, fighting for His Word. Or it reveals someone who's lost. And they get mad and hateful. Once again, I talk about that gospel tract I gave. It wasn't just gospel tracts. There's times I link the gospel message online and people get furious. So angry and hateful and bitter, it just comes right out. First, they're all trying to be like, we're all, you know, we can all hold hands and get along and sing kumbaya. You know, we all need to be accepting and, and everything of each other, and respectful and loving one another. And then you preach the true plan of salvation to them. Their countenance just changes in the writing, though, in the typing. It just changes. They automatically become hateful and bitter. They hate you. How dare you give me the gospel? Are you dealing with someone who's saved? I don't think so. Who knows, in the end, who absolutely knows who's saved and who's lost? Jesus Christ. God does. But like I said, even if it's somebody who's, uh, you know, fallen away. He's a, he's a brother or sister in Christ, but they've fallen away. I still would take him back to the gospel. Absolutely. Okay. I've had brethren that break fellowship with me and say that I, now they're saying I'm a lost heretic. But once again, they never preach the gospel to me. I always preach the gospel to them. Not always. I, I have brothers, brethren that I've broken fellowship with. I didn't preach the gospel to them because it, we break fellowship these days over stupid things. This is not stupid. Let me take that back. This is not stupid. It's important. But I'm saying we're disagreeing on things that aren't Bible. That this, that we both believe this Bible is perfect. We both believe the true plan of salvation. We both believe eternal security. We both believe dispensational teaching. We both believe that we're supposed to be looking for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. We both believe in the Godhead of the King James Bible. But somewhere along the line, we're reading something along here, and we have a disagreement on a passage. He believes it's talking about this. I believe it's talking about that. And people just want to get into arguments and they want to get into fights. Okay? I'll keep studying the issue. You keep studying the issue. If you think you're right, you can try to plant seeds. If, I'm trying, if I believe I'm right, I'm going to plant seeds. We're both trying to preach, preach the truth. We're both trying to fight for the, our Lord and Savior and, and defend His perfect written word. But I've seen brethren just part ways on things like that. You're going to give up a brother in Christ instead of being patient? And having love for a brother in Christ, it just seems like the love just turns to hate like that. What happened to loving your brother in Christ? What happened to having grace? What happened to being patient? And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Right? But once again, they say I'm lost, I'm a heretic. You're just lost. One minute, they love me, I'm a brother in Christ. The next minute, you're lost, you're a heretic. But they never preach the gospel to me. They never link a gospel message. At this, they just want to put me down, put me down, and tear me down, and tear me down. They don't want to see me saved. And that's, to me, that spirit, there's something wrong with that spirit. I'm going to start doubting and go, why are they acting that way? Well, I'm not going to give up on them. I'm going to link the gospel to them. I'm going to keep pointing them to the Word of God as the solution to all their problems. This is the solution. This is the foundation. That's why I tell you, brothers Christ, stay in the Word of God daily. Start your day with the Word of God, end your day with God. Pray over this book. There might be areas where you and I disagree on, but pray over this book. Pray for the brother in Christ that you think is wrong on something here or there. Nothing major, but something like the little things that brethren seem to break fellowship over. You know, pray for them. Right? Don't just, today it just seems like it's so easy just to give up. Give up on the gospel. Give up on preaching truth to people. They seem to love death and hell. That's what we read. People who don't preach the gospel, who refuse to preach the gospel, are ones that love death and hell. And we read that in Proverbs 8.36. All they that hate me love death, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. And we read there that truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. All they that hate God love death. All those who hate the true plan of salvation for today, they love death. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not written in the name of the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. They love death. Right? 
True love for God with all your soul, brother, sister Christ, again, is getting saved and then wanting to see other people get saved. Loving the gospel, the true plan of salvation. You never get tired of it. Even as a saved sinner, I never get tired of preaching the gospel, reading about the gospel. I get convicted all the time reading the gospel. I think that's one of the reasons why, another reason, we didn't really go over that in this study, uh, brethren can get into sin and wickedness and they start to steer clear of the gospel. Why? Because it'll convict you. Oh yeah, that's right. Jesus, I mean, it's not, do you think it's, people, some people can be like that. They'll be like, oh, yeah, Jesus did go through that for me because of these sins. Why am I getting back into it? They don't want that conviction. They start avoiding the book. They start avoiding the true plan of salvation that, that, that saved them. It's another reason why they try to avoid it. But brothers and sisters in Christ, for this study, to encourage you, you got saved the proper way, stay in the plan of salvation with the life that you're living. Don't get tired of it. Preach it. Okay, gospel tract. You want to have that love for, peop for, for the lost world to see them get saved and born again. Okay? True love for Jesus Christ, true love for Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh with all your soul, is obeying the gospel. Where your soul is going to spend eternity, heaven or hell, and where you want to see other people spend eternity, heaven or hell. So I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next study.